Welcome everybody to the second weekend of the Spring Rights Literary Festival. I'm Robin Schwartz. I'm the Program and Grant Director of the Community Arts Partnership. And Spring Rights is just one of our many programs and services. Uh, you've heard of the Greater Ithaca Art Trail. We do the Ithaca Artist Market, the CAP Art Space. We have five grant programs. We've distributed like $4.6 million to local arts events since 1993 when I started the job. There are two more nights of the festival. There's tomorrow, there's going to be the Senior Theater Troupe and uh, they're doing movies, stories from our lives. And then there's an, a, a group reading, Poetry, Prose and Poe. That's with Mickey Quinn, Andy Sanchez, Kate Doyle, Gwen Davis Feldman and Lizzie Frank. And then at seven, Jay Leeming is going to, he's a storyteller. He's gonna do stories from the Odyssey. And then after that, we're gonna have eight free writing workshops starting in March and going all the way, starting in December and going all the way through March. I wanna do a quick plug for Kappapalooza. Kappapalooza is our annual fundraiser where we ask people to donate used art, art that you have in your closets in your basements, art that you inherited, art that you bought as presents and you don't want, art that you got as gifts and you don't want. And um, Judith, who is on the call, uh, her husband gave us what we deem the ugliest piece of art last year. And Judith, I want you to know that we this year have, I think the same artist, an owl painted on black velvet in the same frame that looked like it was hacked out of a coconut. Um, so come see this really vintage, um, quirky, interesting uh, sale. We have over 400 pieces donated and the prices are way low, like, you know, five, 10, 15, $20 so that we could sell out in three days and make a lot of money. Uh, first Saturday on the art trail is also this Saturday. So if you wanna visit some artist studios, check out our website, which I'll put in the chat. And I wanna thank our uh, sponsors, Marriott, uh, the Ithaca, Ithaca College, Wegmans, m and Bank, and the Odyssey Bookstore. We also have funds from the New York State Council on the Arts and Poets and Writers. And we would love to ask you for a donation to our CAP annual fund. Um, I was going to do suggested donations for spring rights, but I thought, no, people aren't going to come. It needs to be free. But of course, we do need money. So if you would like to donate, we would love it. Any amount is fine. And I'm going to put the link up in the chat. Um, you will all be on mute throughout the events. As I've said, the speakers um, actually, uh, you can unmute yourselves. But everybody, use the chat to talk to each other. Uh, Tell us what you think, say hi, do whatever you want with chat. So I am now going to introduce the first reader. However, my introduction is in my email and I forgot to print it out. So you're now waiting for my email to come up on the screen. Has anyone noticed that when someone is waiting for you to do something on your computer, it takes like eight times as long, or maybe it just seems to? Here we go. Okay. I am introducing Melanie Bush. <laughs> Melanie Bush, as you can see, is currently in hibernation. However, she has agreed to wake up solely to do this reading, after which she will return to the land of sleep and dreams. She has left instructions that to wake her, I must sing a line or two from the Everly Brothers classic, All I Have to Do is Dream. Uh, okay. <laughs> When I want Mel to read her prose, I have to sing to wake her doze. So if you want to hear her, all you have to do, sing with me, even though I can't hear you, is dream, 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 dream. dream. That worked. <laughs> Look, Melanie's awake. Go for it. Thank you, Robin. That worked. So you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. 
Well, since I am awake, I guess I'll read a, a couple of pages from my novel in progress. This scene takes place in the early 1990s. Out, uh, shit. Connie came to the halfway as much as the agent would let her. And after six months now, that added up to a lot of gigs. But one day, right before Christmas, something terrible happened at the halfway. Something that shattered the safety on which all Connie's go-go happiness depended. A really cute guy came in. He was about her age, short and solid, with black hair, dark almond-shaped eyes, and a small white smile. Exactly the type of man she was attracted to in real life. The result of his appearance was immediate. Connie became completely unable to do her job. In a second, she could no longer do any of the things the job required. How could she be standing on a stage wearing tiny underwear, smiling out at men from between her legs and pretending to grab her own ass? She suddenly felt completely ridiculous. Everything now was thrown into question. What horrible thing had gone wrong between men and women that they created places where they acted like this? Suddenly she was not a stripper, she was just herself and all the thoughts she needed to think to do this job evaporated. But she still had to work. Looking everywhere but at him, Connie jiggled and shimmied and bent. She tried to focus on the halfway's other customers but there weren't many and none were paying attention. The cute guy was, he held out a 10. She walked over. The customer's eyes were all on the exact level of her crotch. How had she never noticed that? How you doing? He smiled up. He had dimples on both sides of his mouth. I'm okay, how are you? Good, great actually. Talking to him at least got her out of dancing for him. Now she could just stand there. The bartenders didn't care what you did at the halfway as long as the men bought you drinks between sets. Will you sit with me after your dance? 20 minutes later, Connie sat next to him on a stool. He bought her a drink, one of the 12 screwdrivers she drank on her six in between set breaks. His name was Michael. He, his family was Italian too, from a town maybe not too far from where her family came from. And what do you do when you're not here, I mean? Me? None of the guys ever asked about her real life. Yeah, you. He was smiling at her, a tell me a secret smile. She wanted to crawl into his mouth where she would be safe, where he couldn't see her anymore. His fingers traced figure eights in the wetness on the bar. Are you a student? No, well, I was, I finished high school last year. That's good, I was afraid you were jail bait. The bartender stood in front, of, in front of them. It was time for her second screwdriver. Another one, Michael asked. Yes, thanks, extra strong, please. That was her code with the bartender that she wanted the vodka left in. Another for me too then, said Michael, waving his glass of something manly and amber. I almost never come to places like this, he said, but I never met anyone like you there. The new drinks arrived. Connie sucked at hers furiously. Her next set started in five minutes. Michael, I kind of feel that way about you too. And I don't know if I can, I mean, could you just leave? Okay. He didn't seem to think it was weird. Can I see you again? Can I have your phone number? The bartender was waving at her, pointing at the clock. Okay, but do it here under the table. They leaned down, their heads almost touching. Boy, was this against the rules, even at the halfway. He wrote his number on a napkin. Call me. His fingers were hard and hot as they touched hers under the bar. She ran into the ladies' room. By the time she looked out from the stage, he was gone. Driving back to the city in a wild rainstorm, dark already, though it was only five o'clock. She'd thrown Michael's number into her purse with all the other paper men had given her, damp piles of singles and fives. A police car streaked up behind her. She saw the lights before she heard the siren. 
red lines bleeding down her rear windshield in the sheets of rain. Great. Maybe she'd get a ticket for drunk driving. She didn't feel drunk, but she must smell like it. What would that mean? Fines, points on her license, jail? She pulled onto the shoulder. The rain was heavy and hard and sounded like nails hammering into the hood, the lid of a coffin. She could hear water rushing under the car like a river. Maybe the rain would sweep her away, a metal coffin for a living doll. The cop car stopped behind her, red light revolving, a silent heartbeat. They always made you wait to make you feel frightened, to make you feel small. They learned it from TV shows. Connie sighed angrily. It was cold in the car. She'd rushed away wearing only a robe. She jumped to a hard wrap on her window. She rolled it down a few inches. Cold rain hit her face. Driver's license. Connie fished around in her bag, pushing aside stockings and shoes, the odor of sweat and cigarettes wafting up. She grabbed her wallet, bulging with singles she hadn't bothered to cash in for 20s. She handed him the license. Open the window, ma'am. She rolled it down more. What seems to be the problem here, officer? She learned how to act with cops from TV shows too. The cop didn't answer. Of course not. He had his cop hat pulled down over his eyes. Open the window, ma'am. She rolled it down all the way, was instantly soaked. See, it's me. The cop tilted his head back and looked at her. You came from the halfway. Connie stared ahead. This guy had followed her all the way from the halfway? She was almost at the Holland Tunnel that was five miles. Lots of cops went to the bars when they were off duty. Was he a customer? If there's no problem, officer, I really have to be going. There is a problem. What? There's something wrong with your car. It's pumping black smoke out the tailpipe. What? Connie twisted around but couldn't see anything. Is that serious? She leaned out the window into the rain trying to see the back of her car. Might be, said the cop. Well, thanks for telling, telling me. I'll get it looked at first thing in the morning. She felt safer now. Just a car problem, no jail. The cop didn't move, his eyes stalled on her robe where it had fallen open. I can't let you drive all the way to 230 East 6th Street in this condition, Miss DeSalvo. Connie jumped, but remembered that her name and address were on her license. I'll be fine. You could get into a dangerous situation out here. You think something could happen before I get home? The cop didn't answer. Rain slapped her face. She felt her will drain out of her. He gazed at her with dead, flat eyes. Okay, could you give me a ride to a payphone and I can call a tow truck? He nodded once, then turned and walked back to his car. The revolving red light went out. She waited for him to pull up beside her, but it didn't happen. He expected her to walk to him through the rain. She pulled her robe tight and got out. She watched his white face watch her. She got in. There's a gas station off the next exit. I'm sure they have a phone I can use. The doors clicked shut. She watched her own car recede through the sheets of rain, a wavering red blob, and then nothing. Don't worry, the cop said. I know a place. She faced the side of his head. She looked at his shirt for his name, but he wasn't wearing a badge. On the backs of his hands, he had shiny black hairs. He drove past the exit. Hey, that was the exit. Excuse me, can you turn around? I'm soaking wet and I don't wanna get sick. He looked straight ahead. Some people might think you already are sick. What? You heard me. Inside her head, blood hit the top of her skull, banged back down. You can let me out right here. I'll take you where you need to go. Outside the window, wet black highway slid away. If she jumped from a moving car, would it kill her? A huge truck appeared. When they pulled parallel to the truck's cab, Connie pressed the window button. Surprisingly, it rolled down. She stuck her head into the knives of water. Help me, help me. Her voice was tiny, swallowed by the huge flap of the truck's tires against the road. 
The cop grabbed her arm and yanked her back in. Her head slammed against her sh his shoulder and he pushed her away. Don't touch me, bitch. She slumped against her door. How can you do this? Aren't you a cop? He laughed without moving his face. Connie almost laughed too. She felt like she was already dead. He swerved across the highway to a place with broken bottles and broken cement. He left the motor running while he unbuckled his belt. He was going to rape her, rape her and kill her and throw her body in the dirty bushes where rats would eat it. And no one would ever know a cop had done this to her, to her. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Matt Gordon. Matt dreams with water and without, in stereo or mono. On waking, he rarely remembers, but Thursday night, it was a van backing slowly off a cliff and a long time into taffy fall into water. Everyone, thankfully, survived. Thanks, Melanie. Um, and thanks for reading. That was really, really, really powerful. Um, super grateful and thankful to be reading with everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in, everyone else. Um, some context for what I'm going to read. Uh, it's a section of a short story called uh, Softer Engines. And it's told from the perspective of a woman named Raina, who is uh, She's participating in a uh, nighttime parenting class that she's obligated to be in by Child Protective Services. Um, and she's had a particularly bad night. Um, when the story picks up, she is outside, it's nighttime. She's abruptly left the class uh, and she's in one of those plastic towers you would find on a kid's playground with another woman who's also in the class for the same reason. Um, and they've just taken um, some prescription opioids. Um, and this is the first time that Raina has relapsed um, in many months. So that's where things pick up. We sit in the dark for a long time, not talking. It's just night sounds. Soon the warm release comes and we're gone. Somewhere very far away, car doors are clapping shut, motors grumbling to life. And I'm floating above the playground, safe from everything, the sensation of thick blankets coming on, covering me, the air now cool against my face. The engines move away in the distance while I do the same, forgiven and forgotten. I rouse to the sound of a fish flailing inside a plastic bucket. My eyes open to a paler dark and it's Dee Dee, her legs kicking spasmodically, the heels of her sneakers skittering against the hard plastic, her arms pressed tight to her sides as if bound there. I sit forward, still swimming in the thick liquid of the drug and attempt to hold her legs, but she's strong and her knees bruise my chest. Dee Dee, I say, putting my hand against her face. Dee Dee, my hands rush to every pocket on me, hollow gloves sifting through pine needles. They scour my bag, groping for the phone that isn't there. How is it just gone? I'm about to climb down from the tower when I remember Dee Dee's phone. Frantically, I move my useless hands in manic sweeps over the floor, trying and failing to be methodical. I check Dee Dee's pockets as best I can, given her convulsions. Dumb with panic, I check my own again. Dee Dee's shaking has slumped her body into an extreme version of the pose she's taken each week in class. Then I see it. Down through the open hatch, lying on the wood chipped ground, is her phone. Its face lit a pale blue. I scramble down, flip it open, and I'm about to dial 911, but stop. I need to think. There's got to be someone else. But I only know a small handful of numbers by heart, none of them useful now. I click the symbol that looks like a phone book, and I'm scanning down through Dee Dee's contacts. I hear a squeezed, tinny voice Mom? Hello? I put the phone to my ear and listen. A beat of silence, then, Mom! 
I hold the phone out and look at the screen, which has changed to say, call from Gabe. What the fuck? Icy sweat flushes from my palms and I struggle to keep my grip on the phone. All of this is wrong. I wait what feels an impossibly long time. Mom, I say nothing. Can't make words come. Then the soft, distorted snip of the line being cut. I look at the screen, the text blinking. Call ended, zero minutes, 47 seconds. I jab the end button again and again and again, desperate for the certainty that he's no longer there, waiting for a reply. I dial 911. From the direction of the parking lot, the tense rattle of a woman's voice stands out against the shrill curtain of cicadas. I snap the phone shut and run, unsteady over the soft ground. When I reach the parking lot, I find Lorna, yelling into her own phone in the midst of some argument. She jumps at the sound of my sneakers slapping the asphalt and wheels around. I watch her expression flip from terror to relief, then deep concern, all in the space of a second. Hang on, she says into the phone before clamping it to her chest. Reina, what's wrong? Dee Dee, I gasp, she needs to go to the hospital. Where is she? I point back toward the playground and Lorna taking this in seems to work everything out in her mind. Her expression makes the subtle leap to anger as I tell her, we need to go now. We get in Lorna's car and move silently over the lawn to the playground, close as we can get. She follows me up onto the wood chips and then to the small plastic tower where Dee Dee is still and slumped in the dark awkward and unconscious. I climb up its side and kneel beside her, my fingers fumbling for a pulse at her neck. I can't find it, but I'm not sure I'm doing it right. It hits me then that if Dee Dee dies, if she's already dead, they will take Kayla. The police will make me talk and I won't be able to lie about this, about being here with Dee Dee. They'll test my blood and I'll tell them everything and then they'll take my daughter. We need to get her in the car, I say, because it's too much to think now to run out every single thread, to consider anything. I position myself to lift Dee Dee, arms forked beneath her arms. Lorna stands just outside the tower, looking like she might be sick. Help me. I shuffle Dee Dee to the edge of the tower and Lorna takes her legs while I climb down and together we hoist her out. It's a ways to the car and though Dee Dee can't weigh much more than a hundred pounds, it's a struggle to get her there and we have to stop twice so I can get a better grip. She has bones and skin and that's all. In the crude yellow light, I see traces of foam at the corners of her mouth, a tuft on her wet chin. I can't help the thought that she's already gone. As we fumble to get her in the back seat, Dee Dee's head hits the frame above the door and I wanna give up right there, all done, sorry. This isn't going to happen, it's too much. The drug pleads for me to abandon this garble, garbled mess of a plan. Just wait for the ambulance to come. Tell us she's dead. Lorna rushes around to the opposite door and drags Dee Dee by her torso until she's upright with her feet inside. We slam the doors, get in and drive off. For a full minute, we're silent. I click on the dome light and look back and I'm sure of it now. Lorna keeps glancing up into the rear view asking, is she dead? And I say, no, 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 over and over until we're both quiet again. I'm dissolving back into nothing when we pass an ambulance, its lights blaring soundlessly. Lorna turns to me, her eyes asking, keep going, I say, because we can't get there fast enough as it is because she's probably already gone and though it's too late, this is the only thing we can do to act as if we're doing something that matters. Just as we're coming to the main entrance of the hospital, Lorna pulls over onto the shoulder. What are you doing? My heart, now the flailing fish. Get out, Lorna says. What the hell? I will drive her up, but you can't be with me. I'm struck dumb. The panic mushrooming. Lorna, fiercely calm, says, you're going to get out of the car and wait until you sober up, get a coffee or something, then come looking for her. Lorna reaches across and opens my door. Reina, she shouts, out. That's that, thank you. Um, up next, Susanna Durbel is grateful for her dreams. 
Uh, otherwise, what would she have to write about? Uh, she's from Ohio. She has a cat named after Klaus Kinski, and she likes the word bittersweet. Susanna Durbel. Hi, um, and I will apologize in advance in case Klaus gets squirrely, which he might, but we'll see. I'm gonna read um, two short things and thank you everybody for being here. Uh, this is called Love Shakes My Heart and with thanks to Sappho as well as to Z Zahava. Be kind to me under the full moon for love shakes my heart. My heart is beating, but not beaten. It is shaken and it is stirred. I'm of two minds whether to tell you this, but as I've taken pen to paper, there's little reason to stop now. The ink flows and my wrist is loose and flexible. The other night I dreamed that you and I had words. The meat of the disagreement was hazy, but it was clear, a disagreement it was. You were shaking your head, no, no, no. And I answered with a shrug of the shoulders and a throwing up of hands. You wagged your index finger in my direction, your head thrust forward between your raised shoulders like a hen in the middle of a strut across the barnyard. The dream was interrupted by a flash of lightning outside the window and the accompanying clap of thunder a few seconds later. In the light from the storm that followed, I saw your sleeping face peeking from under your hair, the tip of a finger pulling down your lower lip like you had reached up to scratch your nose and gotten hung up on the retreat. On the pillow next to your face, a small spot of drool puddled. Then your lips moved soundlessly. I imagined what you were saying in your own dream. Were you also dreaming we were having words? Had my dream jumped from my brain to yours with the thunderclap? Were you dreaming of me at all? I turned my back to you. I did not want to imagine what was going on inside your brain in the dark, in the middle of the night. I did not want to think of that deep, dark cavern lying on the pillow next to mine, unfathomable whether it is day or night. I did not have the energy, the imagination to fill that hole it would still be there in the morning. So I lay there, the clock glowing green and lighting up my face for no one to see. I thought how I must look there sickly and pale, the thin parts of my hair obvious like I never allowed during the daylight hours. I pulled my knees to my chest to ease my feet into a warmer spot. You turned over and pulled the blankets from my shoulders. I rearranged myself as best I could. In the morning, I made coffee and fed the cats. I arranged my hair to hide the thin spots and cooked oatmeal with raisins and walnuts. I shuffled clothes on hangers in the closet back and forth looking for something to wear. Still, you snored on. I was quiet, then louder, then I just went about my day. My heels clicked on the wooden floor and I coughed. You slept on. Your lips were moving again, but I didn't have time to stop and try to decipher the words. I left the house and it was raining. The sky was gray and the roads were shiny and black. Headlights reflected the raindrops that gathered on the windshield before the wipers could get to them. A raccoon lay dead and bloated at the side of the road. Later on, an opossum lay bloody and mangled on the double yellow line. I thought about us having words in my dream and I wanted to know what the argument was about. Was I angry that you had neglected to clean the bathroom though you had promised to do so? Were you shaking your finger at me because I was incapable of understanding how you felt? Did I want something you couldn't give me and you were resentful that I would ask? The disagreement faded as the day wore on. At lunch, I had an uneasy feeling in my stomach like we'd had a real argument that was left unsettled. I messaged you, what's up? And you texted back, not much. The day stretched on and I forgot about you. I forgot how you looked sleeping on your stomach, your hair over your face with a puddle of drool staining your pillow. I forgot that I couldn't decode your mumblings and that you snatched the blankets away in the middle of a cold dark night. I went to meetings, I answered emails, I wrote a report. On the way home, the sun was setting in my rear view mirror 
It gave the interior of the car an orange tint. I rolled the window down and turned the volume up. The wind got tangled in my hair. The air smelled sweet and grassy. The opossum still lay on the double yellow line and the raccoon at the side of the road had been rolled onto its back. A large insect crashed into the windshield and the wipers smeared it all over. In the driveway, I sat in the car looking at the red front door, willing it to open and you to emerge smiling, but you didn't come. And I gathered my things in my arms and managed to open the door. We ate the dinner you had made, then did the dishes. We sat together on the sofa and watched TV. Before we got into the bed, I said to the you in my head, be kind to me under the full moon for love shakes my heart. So that's, that's that one. This one is called could be. The result could be worth the risk, she said. Could be, he said. There's a lot of time between jumping off a cliff and landing, she said. That's true, he said. I wonder about the whistling of the air in your ears, she said, when you jump off that cliff, you know? Hmm, he said. Does the whistle go up or down as you plummet, she said. Does the whistle fall tonally along with your earthly body or does it rise in counterpoint to your fall? Is that the proper use of the term counterpoint, he said. What if all those things we imagine about the future, about dying and pain and loss are all exactly the opposite, she said, not just in content, but in tone. What if, she said, when you're confronted by your murderer, knife in his hand, you see a lost child in his eyes. And instead of thinking about all the events of your life, you see the path that led him to this moment. What if, she said, when you're dying of a broken heart, as they say, instead of picturing walking hand in hand into the sunset with your beloved, you see the people you left behind, shattered and empty. What if, she said, when you're falling off a cliff, the whistle in your ears rises in tone and you hum along and compose an entirely original, beautiful, ethereal song. And before you land, you regret not being able to share it with the world. By the way, he said, by the way, the tank is getting low. We're running on fumes. Is there a station coming up? She said, this road seems so deserted. The mileposts just tick away. There's got to be a station soon, he said. A billboard rose out of the scrubland. It was really just the back of an old drive-in movie screen painted with an advertisement for Hendrix's filling station. Or it might've been Henderson's or Henkel's. You couldn't really tell the paint was so beat up and peeling. There was a logo for knee-high soda too. I'm thirsty, he said. Orange knee-high, she said. Great for me, he said. They drove the five miles the billboard had advertised, but soon they wondered if a one or a two had peeled off, if Hendrix's or Henderson's or Henkel's was actually 15 or 25 miles away because the road was so deserted and only tumbleweeds and road runners crossed it. The sun was going down and a saguaro cactus stood with the light behind it like a cartoon drawing. We should have made the left turn at Albuquerque, he said. She didn't say anything. She thought about the coyote falling off the cliff, Thelma and Louise driving off the cliff and all the explosions she'd seen on TV and in movies with cars landing at the bottom of cliffs. The horizon didn't seem all that far off like a line drawn on a piece of construction paper. It looked like you could just step right over it into another world. What if, he said, there's no gas station on this road? Hmm, she said. What if, he said, the car stops and we end up sleeping at the side of the road? What if, he said, the car just keeps running and running and the needle moves further and further below the E until it points straight down? What if it finally swings around full circle and before you know it, it is just to the right of the F and we just keep going, looking for Hendrix's or Henderson's, she said, and our mouths stay parched, he said. What if, she said, 
What if when the needle gets back to the F, we aren't even thirsty anymore? Hmm, he said. The needle dropped lower and lower and seemed to bounce slightly with each bump in the road. The sun dropped below the horizon and stars came out. There were so many, some of them smeared together. I'm not tired, she said. What if we just keep driving, he said. Hmm, she said. The headlights shone on a small sign planted at the side of the road. It said, today. Half a mile later, another sign said, at noon. They barely looked at the road itself now, waiting for the next sign. He sped up and she rolled down her window. The air whistled in their ears and they waited for what happened next. The end. Thank you. So up next, we have Judith Pratt. Judith is writing a novel in crayon on endless walls, dream stories, journaling the dreams, talking in her sleep, discovering what it means. Hi, everyone. This is really fun hearing everybody's stories. Um, I'm going to read dream stories from my play Chimera. The play is about Sophie, who is nine, and Sophie loves dream stories. Sophie lives with Serena, a poet who writes about mythical beasts, Kraken, Wyvern, Chimera. Samantha, or Sam, an exhausted traveler and adventure, joins them. They all live in a big house in an undiscovered country. And the Chimera visits them. This chimera doesn't look like the mythological chimera. This chimera doesn't do things for reasons discernible to humans, but she's purposeful. Perhaps she's studying the effect of the three women on air molecules. In these excerpts from the play, Sophie gets Sam and Serena to tell her their dream stories. First, we hear from Sam, and there goes my... There we go. Sam says, I used to be a traveler, an adventurer. I've been all over. I've even been to the dry country. After traveling for a long time across the dry country, I finally came to a small town on the edge of the forest. The people weren't unkind, but they were a little wary of strangers. And they were very afraid of the forest, which was funny since they lived so close to it. I found a little house, only two rooms in a loft that no one wanted because it was right on the edge of the forest. I was ready for a rest. So I lived in the cottage, planted a small garden, and earned money advising people about healing, which herbs are good for sickness, things like that. And I taught dancing to some of the young people. Of course, their folks had to watch and be sure I didn't teach their babies anything too outlandish. So this is my dream, or maybe it really happened. Anyway, one day I went to town on some errand or other, and I saw, as if I'd expected it and wasn't surprised, but I don't remember what happened before, before I saw the wagon being drawn down the main street with a young woman, woman in back of it. And everyone was shouting at her, throwing stones stoning her. I knew her. I taught her dancing and they were stoning her. And I just jumped up in the wagon and screamed at the townspeople, screamed that they were stupid, stupid half people who would never get out of the mud of their own way long enough to understand anything other than the ruts they lived in. I don't know what I said, but I got a horse from screaming it. And the people grabbed me and tied me and put me in place of the girl in the wagon. They took me into the forest and bound me in rags so I could only crawl and left me there to eat dirt. I crawled around for a long time like some kind of prehistoric monster. I couldn't stand up. I kept bumping my head into huge tree trunks and eating dirt until I suffocated. 
And then Sophie says, but you got rescued. That's right, says Sam, you rescued me. I did. Mm -mm. I was too little then. But you've always been a good dreamer. You rescued me in my dream. Oh, says Sophie. And then, and then we came to this house and we're happy. Later, Sophie is talking to Serena. And Sophie says, you said you had a new dream story for me. I do, said Serena, but it doesn't come out right. Maybe if I tell it to you, it will. Sam says I rescued her in her dream. Did she? Well, maybe you can rescue me in mine. It's another dream about my ocean. I went down to the beach to go swimming. Ha, no, that's too simple. I felt drawn to the beach. I felt I had to get in the ocean and let it give me energy, fill me up. But when I started into the water, it was full of jellyfish, the stinging kind. And in my dream, I thought, oh, that's no problem. I'll just go further down the beach. But further down the beach, there were worse things in the water, ugly, misshapen, slimy things. Again, I went further down the beach. Sure, I'd find a place to swim. But this time, there were huge monsters in the water, something like a cross between sea serpents and whales. They had huge mouths, huge teeth, and they grinned jovial grins that were more terrible than if they'd snarled and roared. Once more, though, I thought all I needed to do was go further down the beach. And at first, I thought I'd finally found the right place to swim. But as I, I was swimming, the waves filled up with sand. I tried to swim in the sand as though it were water, digging my arms down through the sand and pushing my way along. I kept swimming and swimming, trying to get back to the real ocean. Then I woke up. That's when the Chimera character appears. Sophie isn't afraid of it. What's that, she asks. Is it the Chimera? Why do you think it's a Chimera, Serena asks. The Chimera, because you dreamed it. But Sam and Serena become enthralled by the Chimera, leaving Sophie alone. And Sophie describes her own dream story. I live in the best house. It has stairs up and stairs down. Some of them so steep you have to crawl like when you were very little, but some of them you can just run right up them. One day I went into every single room and every room had a door to a new room and every room had treasures. I found this shell there and this feather and, a, and this set of little, little dolls that all fit in a little, little box. I went for the whole day and there were more rooms that anyone could count, and I can count over a thousand, but there were more than that. But sometimes I have these dreams about the house and I can't get into any of the rooms or find any of the treasures because the hallways don't go where they're supposed to and the stairs are too steep. And one time, one time I was on this stair that got steeper and steeper like a ladder and something was grabbing at my feet while I was trying to climb on this ladder way up, way up, so I was afraid to fall. And I escaped that thing, but then the ceiling came down too low and I couldn't climb anymore. And I was scared to go back that the thing might pull me down by my legs. But then there was another hallway, only it was sort of a shelf, like a cliff. And I couldn't see very well. And there was all this stuff in the way. And I was afraid that some of the stuff would have the thing, the grabbing thing hiding in it. But I got over them all, but then I was on these hanging down claws and I couldn't see and I woke up. I used to have better dreams. Eventually the chimera gets all three women together, but that's another dream story. And save the best for last. My friend Hardy Griffin is next. Hardy's dog, Benny, whines and nuzzles in his dreams, waking Hardy up so he can wobble off and write dreamlike fiction, jealous of Benny, who is no doubt dreaming of eating treats and listening to dreamlike fiction on a dreamy Saturday night. <laughs>
Thank you, Judith. Oh, wow. Wow, what a treat. I mean, uh, to be with all these incredible readers, I am. Um, it's a great honor. So this is a, an excerpt from um, my novel in progress. And um, uh, I don't think it needs an introduction. It'll, it'll all more or less become clear. On the warm afternoon of my friend Akai's death, I found myself stuck in rush hour traffic on 7th Avenue as my car started to heat up. I managed to take a right onto a tree-lined back street where I parked in the shade of a plane tree and sat there with the windows open. The smell of black beans, salted pork, and garlic floated in the window. I hadn't eaten since breakfast nearly 10 hours ago. Over a stairway to a basement restaurant hung a sign, Brazil. I got out. Now the delicious scent was all around me. I went down the steep steps and tried the door. Inside, the handful of tables in the bar were all empty. I sat at the bar. That incredible smell had become almost tangible. Three minutes went by that seemed like three hours. I got up and peeked through the kitchen door. Two men in tank tops and a well-dressed woman were sitting on stools around a small table. They were eating out of a large clay pot. The rest of the small area was filled with the sinks, gas range, oven fridges. A mound of collard greens lay on a cutting board. I apologized for barging in and asked if I could see a menu. The woman stood up, we're all booked this evening. I begged her to sell me a bowl of whatever was in the clay pot. She laughed, she had a bright, open laugh. Your eyes, they're full of hunger. Then she turned and spoke with the men in Portuguese. The older one with a pockmarked face stood and offered me his stool. That. The woman ladled the stew into a bowl. Feijoada, she said. Nice to meet you, I said. <laughs> she laughed that wonderful laugh again. No, the stew is called feijoada. My name's Leia. We all introduced ourselves. I've forgotten the man's name who gave me a seat. The other one was Oalo. The older man brought me a mug of dark beer. Beto im casa. I nodded and thanked him. Then Oalo got up and I saw he was much younger, maybe 16 or 17. He slipped on a rubber apron. I ate the feijoada filled with black beans and onions and pork and earthly spices. and I sucked down the heavy beer. The kitchen was tiny, but seemed super clean in the wan light from the single bulb on the ceiling. I heard Leia come in and speak with the two men in Portuguese. Heard her put orders on her tray and walk back out. Halfway through my bowl of stew, loud Brazilian music started up in the dining room. Oala came, Oalo came over and smiled. He had a missing canine tooth. He filled my bowl and mug every time they were empty. I thanked him and rubbed my stomach. I went through four servings. He was delighted. Eventually, I had to cover my bowl with my hands so he wouldn't fill it again. Um, he patted my head and, fitted, and filled my beer mug once more. The clatter of dishes and the two men's voices were drowned out by the music and thumping rhythm coming from the dining room. After a time that could have been 20 minutes or two hours, I got to my feet. I had to put my hand out and steady myself against the wall. Once I'd straightened up, I went over to Wallo and started helping him wash the dishes. Eventually we caught up and Wallo motioned for me to go out and uh, check out the dining room. When I pulled the kitchen door open, a large man's back filled the doorway. I tapped his massive shoulder and he pivoted. And only then did I see the accordion in his hands and understand that he was singing at the top of his voice. Music. Beyond him, the tables had been set one on top of another along the walls. And the place was packed with people dancing, a kind of country swing, thumping the floor in time with their feet. Leia saw me and reached around the singer to take my hand in hers. She showed me the steps of the dance. As we were all moving, someone hit the dimmer and the wall, white, wall lights went down until we were in a dusky haze of arms and legs, the brick walls radiating the heat of the crowd. The accordionist never paused and the dancers laughed. One called out, woo, in the blur of arms and legs again. I found myself next to a woman who must have been 70. On my other side stood a tall, thin man in a black flat, flat brimmed hat. They spoke to me in Portuguese about their grandchildren on the one hand and a horse ranch on the other. And somehow my measly high school Spanish was enough for me to understand. Out of the dim light, Leia again stepped up to be my partner and smiled as she pulled me close and set her small calloused hand in mine. We sashayed across the wide plank floor. 
the heavy stew and the homemade beer, the brick basement, and this dance that Leia called Poro. None of it felt wrong. The dance demanded we change partners many times, and never have I felt so grateful for such free human touch. Then it ended. They turned the lights up, and the accordionist put away his instrument. People paid and left. I found myself mopping the floor. Leia and I made a joke out of dancing with the broom and the mops. She flipped open her phone and looked at the time. She had to run and catch the last path train to New Jersey with her brother, Koala. I offered to drive them. The man with the pockmarked face said, great. Leia closed out as Owalo and I washed the kitchen mats and set them to dry on hooks. 20 minutes later, we stepped through the door and into the night, Owalo pointing out how the busted street lamp allowed us, allowed us to see a few bright stars over the tops of the buildings. He got in the jump seat of the old sports car. Leia sat next to me. In a minute, we were looping down and around the ramp and into the suddenly bright lights shimmering off the white tile walls in the Holland Tunnel. The railings flitted by. A tiny black circle appeared reflected on the gleaming tiles, and then we were around the last curve and it popped back into the warm night in New Jersey and quickly up onto the elevated interstate. They had told me to follow signs for the one nine and Elizabeth. We skirted Jersey City down on the left and the train yards on the right before going over the Hackensack River. Even after the bridge, the road stayed aloft, the moon shining over the rows of tractor trailers, flashing as it hit the occasional wetland creek, ending between the industrial yards and high fences. The road widened to eight lanes, then split into loco and express as we bent south. I told them how, when I found myself driving late at night like this, it felt as if I were facing the wrong direction, direction on a moving walkway. Tires spun, but maybe the car was staying still as the sky and the earth and the road rolled by. Leia nodded, but I don't think she understood. And when I glanced uh, at, over at Owalo, he was asleep. Just after the airport, Route 9 finally narrowed to two lanes. Up ahead, a bunch of cars had blocked the road, their hazard lights on. From a pickup truck in rapid fire ramp over a legato beat. Once we'd stopped, a blonde boy who must have been in high school sauntered over and told us we had to wait for the drag race. We can walk from here, Leia said, opening her door and letting Oala out of the back. I wanted to say something, but before I could, the high school's kid asked me if I'd put a turbo in the Datsun. And the next thing I knew, he had challenged me to a race. The car felt light without Leia and Oala as I edged along the shoulder up to the front of the line. The blonde kid's Nissan Skyline was ridiculously loud when he revved it. He didn't stand a chance. They actually waved a checkered flag. I laughed and popped the clutch. When I went into second gear, I saw the other car inch behind me in my peripheral vision. I threw it in third. A jet from Newark Airport roared close overhead. Having just taken off, I went into fourth. In the instant when I released the clutch and slammed the gas to the floor, I felt the front wheels leave the asphalt. Wind shot under the car and hit it like a sail. The horizon dropped out of sight. I felt the back wheels also lift off the road. Then the moon slid ever so slowly from the top of the windshield to the bottom. After it disappeared, hundreds of stars glittered across the glass. And then the road returned. It now is upside down and at the top of the windshield, the two lanes of cars parked in the distance behind me. The blonde kid gaped from his car, his eyes locked on mine as the roof of my own car crashed against the pavement. Oh, thank you all very much for coming. <laughs> that, was, that was that. And um, maybe we can open up the, open up the, what do you call this, chat.
and yeah. um, and the poet laureate. Uh, I think there's like two or three scheduled readings at at uh, the with the county, and then it's just hoped that the poet laureate. Um, I've already got a nomination here for Stacy Mur Murphy. So Susanna, you can actually nominate Stacy or Stacy can also apply both ways. It's on our website, artspartner.org. And there's a page all about the Poet Laureate. The deadline for the applications is December 13th, 11th. And yeah, what better place to find some poets? <laughs> right here in the yeah, Poet Laureate. I hope, I hope Dr. Nia's and Dr. Nia herself and her many poets. I actually emailed her and I oh, said, good. you have to apply for this. Yes. So.